So I, I, I guess you had a, a very high level of confidence in the deal at the, at the at that time, isn't it? Because essentially, had it gone the other way that it didn't put you into the success league, these stockbrokers would have come back to your father and say, "Look, this is this is what we said. This is what we are trying to avoid." Did you ever stop to think of that that it could go the other way? Well, I was in the business. I had been in the business for 15 years, and I was absolutely certain yeah. that having Terry Jordan back as the buyer mm. uh, would turn our fortunes. I was absolutely certain of that because he had done very well leaving us. He was he was like the old Ratners. I had seen Ratners being successful under him. Yeah, it wasn't a it wasn't a gamble. I was a hundred percent certain that this would work. He was the he was the key to, um, you know, to, to to succeed. I couldn't see anything going wrong with it. So yeah. the fact that I had so much resistance made me feel even better about it because I knew I was right, uh, and I knew I was going to prove those people wrong. Uh, and they did, in fact, those two stockbrokers came to my office. Uh, a few months later when I'd done the deal and it was all going well, they came in to apologise. <laughs> but mm -hmm. I accepted their apology and then I sacked them. <laughs> and I pointed my own stockbrokers because I, I felt that they uh, didn't give me any support whatsoever. <laughs> and totally, these are the people that I didn't want to listen to advice from. Yeah, well, so... They got what they deserved in a way, isn't it? Hindsight it was a wonderful thing for them, in a way. Well, the thing is that stockbrokers are there to make a short-term gain. Yeah. They look at the long picture. So they are opportunistic, aren't they? You know? Exactly. And maybe mm -hmm. if I was a stockbroker, I'd be exactly the same. Yeah. I'd, I'd yeah. And, uh, worry about my own uh, destiny, <laughs> not anybody else's. But you yeah. should be aware yeah uh of that yeah perfect so now you know you took uh ratners into this uh global empire you know making close to you know, about billions of sales and profits in the millions and then uh this happened i'll just uh, play you a quick uh, uh clip actually uh, i think i know what you're gonna play me yeah <laughs> <laughs> good afternoon mr president your royal highness ladies and gentlemen and thank you, Mr. President, for asking me to address such a prestigious audience. Also in Ratners, uh, we sell gifts as well as jewellery. Things like a teapot for two quid. Um, or we've got this imitation book that you lay on your coffee table. The pages don't actually open, uh, but uh, they're beautiful curled up corners with imitation antique dust. I know it's, you might say, it's not in the uh, best possible taste, but we sold a quarter of a million of them last year. Um, we also do this uh, nice sherry decanter, it's cut glass, and it comes complete with six glasses on a silver plated tray that your butler could uh, bring you in, he serve you drinks on. And it's really only cost four pounds 95 pence. People say to me, how can you sell this for such a low price? I say, because it's total crap. <laughs> um, we even sell a pair of earrings for under a pound. Gold earrings as well. And some people say, well, that's cheaper than a prawn sandwich from Marks and Spencers. But I have to say, the sandwich will probably last longer than the earrings. But no. <laughs> So what what goes through your mind when you listen to this again and again these days? <laughs> well, I do. <laughs> People do play it all the time. Um, it's something that I have to live with. It's just mm. like if you've been in an accident and you've got a scar across your face. Yeah. Um, you... you you have to live with it. It's a regrettable, to say the least, yeah. part of my life because you saw how successful the business was before that mm. and how unsuccessful it was after that. Mm. But yeah. I cannot spend 
the last 30 years uh, moaning and being bitter about it. Yeah. So I have um, used it to as much as, I mean, we wouldn't be doing this podcast probably if it wasn't for that, you know? Um, I, would, I wouldn't be doing speeches around yeah. Europe if it wasn't for that. Mm. I, I wouldn't have been in the health club business and sold my health club business for four million pounds if it wasn't for that. Yeah. So just like this COVID-19, there's always, however terrible something is, yeah. there's always silver lining. There's always something. There's always something that um, is good about it. You know, that, that's how life is. It's not yeah. all bad. You know, during the war, the Second World War, there were good things. And yeah. I've had some of the good things in this. And there has been, you know, because uh, in some ways um, it's helped me, you know. Yeah. I know it's ridiculous, but it's I, I've tried to turn what is a huge negative into a positive. Yeah. So I mean, if, if, you, if you take us through this a little bit leading to that speech and then what happens afterwards, just for the benefit of some of our listeners who wouldn't uh, so much uh, be aware of uh, uh, the background uh, to this speech. <clears throat> well, after I made the speech, um, I had no idea that it would have the effect that it had. Mm. Uh, how did I know that it was going to be on the front pages of the papers the next day? Mm. Nobody would have thought that. I'm not blaming anybody. It was a silly thing to say, but the reaction was ridiculously over the top to somebody who made a joke about a sherry decanter. <laughs> Well, the press could see there were there was an opportunity here to be disingenuous and to make it a much bigger thing than it really was. Yeah, about a show decanter and a pair of earrings, mm -hmm. uh, they turned it into, well, I said all my jewellery was crap, which of course I never did. In fact, in that same speech, I said all my jewellery is high quality, yeah. sold by highly trained staff, but we sell a sherry decanter. So they turned it into something it wasn't. But that's what the press do. Yeah. Uh, you know, they try and create a story which isn't, isn't you know, wasn't really a story. Um, but, you know, I shouldn't have given them that ammunition in the first place. Yeah. Uh, but nobody could have imagined that it would be on the front page. Then, Especially yeah. the President de Klerk, uh, who was the other speaker, the President of South Africa, mm. um, at that same uh, conference talked about ending apartheid, which was, you know, quite, <laughs> quite much more serious than uh, what I was doing. Yeah. Uh, it, 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 the front pages were not about uh, ending racial segregation the next day. It was about a sherry decanter. So mm. that's the press for you. But yeah, well. so it had a very, uh, as you know. It had a horrendous effect on my business. Mm. There was no social media, but word soon got around mm. and sales uh, initially in Ratners started suffering, which we could live with to a certain degree because Ratners, believe it or not, was only a very small part by now of the business. Mm. We had a huge business in America. We had uh, H. Samuel, which was much, much bigger. I mean, H. Summer was making 60 million, where Ratners was making about 6 million. So just to give you a context of mm. how important H. Summer. But then after about a month or two, H. Samuel, it became apparent to people, consumers, that I owned H. Samuel as well. Mm. And that was, that was the, uh, the, the really uh, worrying point of view. And then H. Samuel started losing sales at the top end with diamond rings and stuff like that. <clears throat> mm. And yeah, we, we, we uh, didn't make, the, you won't be surprised to hear that we didn't make the 200 million pound that year. Mm. Uh, we made a loss. Uh, mm. Although in America, we were unaffected. And just give you a difference between the press in America and the press in the UK, I was quite well known in America. I had a thousand shops. I was the second largest jewelers there. 
uh, they didn't write it up at all. This this speech was of no interest to them. Not one line was written in America about this. Yeah, they didn't think it was a story of any importance. Mm. It's just the sun and the mirror who want to attack the wealthy at a time of recession, mm. blame it on them because everybody was struggling in 1991, uh, picked on me uh, as the person, you know, as person who has contempt for their customers. And anybody that knows me knows yeah. that it was a joke about Sherry Decanter and I don't have contempt for customers, exactly the opposite. But yeah. that was that was the hurtful thing, which, by the way, is still said today, 30 years on. Mm. I mean, if you read Twitter, uh, I still get horrendous abuse every day on Twitter. Mm. Um, but, you know, I've learned to live with, uh, yeah. with it, and it's toughened me up, and mm. I can deal with things. I can deal yeah. with I can deal with this. I can deal with this pandemic better than most because I've been through tough times. Yeah, tough times, yeah. A lot of people that are moaning about it are people who've had it very easy. Yeah. Not, 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 I'm not generalising with everybody because a lot of people have generally really badly suffered, and I feel very bad for them. But there's no yeah. question about the fact that a lot of rich people are moaning um, because they've never had setbacks before. Mm. So if, if you can take us through what, what then happened with the speech and then your bankers and then how you exited in the business, how, how did that all unfold? <laughs> well, obviously, if your sales start plummeting, your profits disappear. Yeah. yeah. You can be unpopular with the press. You can live with that. Yeah. You can be unpopular with your shareholders. You can live with that. Mm. But what you can't be unpopular with is your bank, who you owe money to. That is, that is, the, that is something that uh, you don't want to be in that situation. You can live with everything, bad press, mm. unpopularity. You cannot live with being unpopular with your bank manager. Yeah. And I was called into the bank because I'd broken my covenants. Mm. And by then, I'd owed them a billion pounds. Wow. And uh, they said to me that uh, you need to uh, talk to all the banks because it's not only Barclays that you owe this money to. It's what happens if you have a big debt is they farm it out into a consortium. Mm. I had to go to all the banks, persuade them to keep me going because they could pull the plug. They had the right. Mm -hmm. The loan that anybody gives you, whether you're borrowing £10 or a billion pounds, is conditional on certain um, conditions that, are, that I broke. And one of the conditions was that my profits couldn't go down below, I don't know, 30 million or 40 million or something like okay. that. That would, that would trigger a break of covenant. Mm. So I hired a chairman uh, to help me because I was the chairman and chief executive of the group. I hired a chairman with banking experience. Mm -hmm. And uh, he ended up firing me. <laughs> so <laughs> that again, I'd taken people's advice, like the mm -hmm. bank said, yes, it's a good idea to bring in uh, experience, an older man from the city, because I was still only about 43. Oh, yeah. Bringing him who's been round the block in his 60s, mm. he CEO of Courtauld's or Coatesville, one of the big companies. Mm. Scottish guy, um, very dour, mm. very serious, the opposite of me. Mm. Um, and we didn't get on. Well, we got on at first, but we didn't get on. And he, after 18 months, he fired me. Mm -hmm. So uh, I had basically uh, was in a bad place. Yeah, I'd yeah. lost, uh, what well, you know, the day before I'd arrived at the Albert Hall to do the speech, I was on the crest of a wave. I arrived in my Bentley, chauffeur-driven Bentley. I'd made all that profit. I had houses all over the place. 
Mm. And then 18 months later, I had nothing. The shares had gone to 2p. I had debt. I'd lost my house. I'd take my kids out of school. I was penniless. Mm. That, that's... That's a massive fall from grace, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Yes. My, my mother said to me, one day you can be cock of the walk and another day you can just be a feather duster. Mm. Um, life is like that. Yeah. It can be taken away from you uh, very quickly. Or the reverse can happen. You can suddenly, you know, win the equivalent of the lottery or something. Yeah. 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 And how, how, what did that do to your mental health and well-being i started taking uh, antidepressants mm. but that didn't help me get another job because it made me just very insular and withdrawn mm. and i didn't speak much so uh i really uh, so the turning point really was when i started cycling yeah um doing exercise cycling 25 miles a day, which I still do to this day. Wow. At the age of 71. Mm. And uh, that was, made me realize the benefit of health and fitness. Mm. So I, I opened up a health club at that stage, seven years after I left Ratner's, even yeah. though I didn't have any money. I had taken a site, put it in solicitor's hands, and tried to sell membership for a club that I hadn't bought. Mm -hmm. But I was successful in that, sold 800 memberships, and, and because of that, I uh, managed to raise the money. And two and a half years later, I sold it for four million pounds. So I was back on my feet. Wow, wow. Mm -hmm. I then invested half of that into online business, which started turning over 25 million back in jewelry. Mm. Uh, and I was then doing speeches about it. Mm. And life, although very different from how it was, had become good again. Yeah. Probably I'm even better. So when people ask me whether I regret saying what I said, <laughs> I, I do regret it. I do regret it. There's always a, I like to, people to think, however terrible something happens to you, that it's not the end of the world. Yeah. I mean, is, is that a classic example of, uh, you know, someone who, if you have the, the business knowledge and the instincts about business, because that's uh, knowledge, isn't it, and experience, even if you get knocked down, does that necessarily mean if you bring those skills back, if you bring that experience back, you can always rise again? <laughs> Uh, yeah, I think your most valuable, I think you're right. I think your most mm. valuable asset is not what yeah. you have in the bank. It's what yeah. you have in you. Mm. If you, you know, they say a fool and his money is soon parted. And the opposite is true. Even if you don't have any money, if you do have ability, even yeah. though you might lose it through bad luck or bad judgment, um, it's not the end of the world. In fact, a lot of the great business people today are ones that have gone bust or they've gone close to losing it. Yeah. The trouble is in this country, we write people off too quickly. Mm. We don't give them a second chance. Yeah, yeah. But that that's just reflective of how competitive the world has become, isn't it? Yeah.